So what you see, what I see, is what you are. Yes. And in that sense, everybody who sees you knows you as yes. much as they're ever likely to know you. But, but they know me very well, because that's all there is to know. I mean, I don't go away from here and indulge in some wild fetishes or wild weirdo <laughs> things or anything like that. I mean, they're... If you turn my stone over, there ain't nothing underneath it. It's, it's probably a boring stone. What you're seeing is actually what there is, full stop. So, here, the, the, the moral of this story <laughs> is that if we search for something inside you, we will not find anything. This is quite obviously going to be a difficult topic of discussion. Those familiar with my channel will hopefully know that whilst I never shy away from difficult topics, I don't like to sensationalise them or ramp things up for the sake of it when I know it could be very emotionally overwhelming. So I'm going to try and keep this as relaxed as I can. I'm likely to try and edit some of my typical calm music into the background unless I listen back and decide the calmness makes it sound jarring and insensitive to the darkness of the topic. I'm not sure, you know? Either way, this video needs a disclaimer that it's a very serious, chilling topic of discussion because Jimmy Savile is a man who sexually abused at least 450 people. Probably many more who either died or never felt able to reveal it over the span of 50 years. Ranging in ages from 5 to 75, though predominantly underage girls. That's the person we're discussing today. I am a counsellor, I am known among various other types of videos on this channel to get into the psychology and provide psychoanalysis of characters from film and fiction such as my videos analysing each of the characters from The Breakfast Club or Whacking Phoenix's Joker. I try to go beyond just offering a diagnosis because there's many other channels out there who will do that far better than I could. I like to focus more intensely on the feelings, where certain behaviours may stem from, the backgrounds, the specifics of the individual, but I've never analysed a real human being before on this channel. I don't really agree with doing that. I think it's um, a horrifically exposing thing to do to a real person on the very near impossible chance they might view it or someone that knows them would. I don't think that rule exactly applies for someone dead, admittedly, especially when they're the sort of person Jimmy Savile was. I also tend to like making videos where there's a degree of hope that can come out of the experience, whereas a video like this, it would probably feel very forced if I tried to do that. Um, although that said, we will We'll finish this with a section for some downtime where we can sort of relax again and step back. And so whilst this isn't the typical sort of video I like to make, I think there is some purpose to it, to doing something like this once on my channel. It probably only will be once. I think to some extent as a society we need to be able to recognise and reflect on the fact that people like this exist and stories like this do happen. They're unbearable to think about often and it's for that we shut them out, but when a society is shutting them out as an entire culture, that's when it becomes incredibly difficult to stop and prevent this sort of thing from happening. And I want to be clear, um, I should hope it is clear, this video is seeking simply to try and understand how a child might grow up into the sort of person Savile became. Not to explain or certainly excuse his behaviour, because I don't even think this will explain it. Many, many people suffer all sorts of horrendous experiences in childhood and life, and yet do not grow into such adults like Jimmy Savile. I have to be clear on that point, and an attempt will nonetheless be made to understand his psychology. I hope the better we can understand, the better we can process our fears, but but also the better we can recognise vulnerable children that might need help and protection, be it people who might need protection from such people as Savile, or children who may be as Savile once was and may need support and intervention in order to stop them ever growing into the sort of people he became. I think this is always going to be an attempt to understand that will fall short, not just because I don't know enough, not just because the information we have about his life is quite limited, but also because joining the dots between his actions and his childhood, whilst it might offer some degree of insight, still doesn't paint a clear picture or help us understand why he became the way he did when so many others with similar experiences did not. So like all my videos, don't take anything as an answer or a clear argument. This is just my attempt to think about and make sense of something and partly I think it's because there is some purpose to doing this once. Partly because I watched the recent Netflix documentary on him and I was 
disappointed by how little they went into psychology and actually even with what I've tried to search for online through articles and things there's very little attempts I can find anywhere to go into his psychology partly also because he's a part of British culture I remember all the news stories about him when I was young and the truth revealed I know my girlfriend's mum worked in a hospital where Jimmy Savile regularly attended I think all of that kind of stuff makes this more personal somehow more important for me to try and wrap my head around so for anyone unaware I'm not sure how well known this story is outside of the UK who is Jimmy Savile this bit's gonna kind of just be a quick biography of his general life he was born into a working-class family in Leeds in 1926 as the youngest child of seven he worked his early life in the coal mines during World War II until an explosion caused him to suffer spinal injuries that took him a long time to recover from wearing a steel corset and walking with sticks for three years in the early 40s he began to play records in dance halls and in his own probably flimsy words claimed to be the first DJ he seemed to have a knack for it though and moving into the 50s and 60s he started managing ballrooms and dance halls as well as getting a break as a radio DJ to which he quickly became one of the UK's most popular DJs and from there he basically found his way to the forefront of British television hosting and appearing on a near endless amount of shows you can't exaggerate just how big he was. He hosted Top of the Pops, on which all the big musical acts of the day appeared. He hosted live events, children's programs such as Jim Will Fix It, which ran for 19 years of children genuinely writing to the show like a child would to Santa, saying what they wish for, be it to fly, to drive James Bond's car, whatever it might be, in that kind of heartwarming, innocent way that children do and then Jim and his team finding ways to fix it and make that wish as much a reality as possible. Back then he was a face adored by children across the nation and by parents. It seems he was a genuinely skilled presenter and I think that combined with his eccentric nature, possibly even the fact he was northern and had a general presence to him that was very much outside the typical slick, slightly restrained, well-spoken manner of old British television presenters and things. I wonder if that made him feel to the public more like someone they knew, more someone in their hearts. He was probably the biggest face on TV for a lot of his time. The reason he was so greatly adored by the public though was because of his charity work. Jimmy Savile regularly for years and years volunteered to help out as a porter at hospitals as well as helping out at and hosting events at care homes, schools, prisons, donating huge sums of money raised through incredible fundraisers. Estimates suggest he raised as much as 40 million for various different causes which when you consider the inflation since the 60s, 70s, 80s, the sum would be even bigger by today's standards. Holding endless sponsored events or marathons, working tirelessly with a relentlessness that to some could seem superhuman. He didn't marry, he didn't settle, he absorbed his waking day working on TV, volunteering in hospitals and care homes and raising for charity. And when that's all you know of him, when you don't know the truth, it's easy to see why he was so adored by the public. When he died, he was revered as a national treasure. When that's all you know, it seems quite incredible how such a well-known, busy celebrity would find time for years and years, both to help working at hospitals and also to raise so much money. But at the same time, it might baffle you to understand why he was allowed to volunteer in hospitals at all. I think partly that's because this was the 60s, 70s, 80s in particular, and there weren't so many restrictions in force back then. Uh, partly it's because he was such a well-known, adored figure who appeared to be trying to do good. You know, he was a figure in the collective minds that people felt they knew that's Jimmy, he's safe, we all see he does positive charity work, he must obviously be a good person. Helped mostly I think by his funds though, I don't think for a second nurses and doctors or teachers on the ground level who saw Jimmy more directly volunteering, I don't think they liked or trusted him whatsoever, but it's those who are in charge, the ones running the hospitals and schools who needed Savile's exorbitant donations, the ones he worked to charm and form good relationships with, same as the police officers he was on good terms with, or a vast array of celebrities, or the Prime Minister he became friends to, or the royal family who sought his advice. Did any of those sorts of people know what he was doing? Probably some. I doubt all of them. He had an ability to manipulate and consequently fool people 
people. But of those who did know, perhaps they didn't care as long as they got donations, which is shocking to think, but possible. Perhaps it benefited them, perhaps they kept the information in their back pocket in case someday would ever come up where they might need leverage over him. That wouldn't surprise me with politicians. Who knows? The point is, a nurse who might complain may have found themselves transferred. A child who might have reported it may not have been believed. Not believed when compared against a man that everybody on TV seems to think is the best person alive. A man with a knighthood and friendships with royalty. I went into our, our gated area where I saw my immediate superior then, and as far as I know he reported it. And uh, the following day, I asked what was the outcome, and it was really just, well, nobody appears to be interested. If people did try to press charges, he would threaten to take them to court, and especially when you do think you're the only one, it would take an insurmountable degree of strength to stand up to someone like him. He carried on for five decades pretty much abusing anyone he felt like. He died a national treasure because the few reports against him were dropped or ignored, a documentary made was silenced by the BBC Top Brass. It wasn't until after his death that the truth started coming forth, and I think the most disturbing thing about this story is how long that took. But I think more details about how it was kept quiet, how it all broke, how Savile went about everything, I'll leave to the Netflix documentary. We're here to talk about psychology, so we're going to get into that now. I think we'll start with the less overwhelming stuff by talking about his charity work first, because he did take it to unusually large levels. When it comes to volunteering at and visiting hospitals and care homes and schools and everything, we know he's got a clear conscious reason for wanting to go there. He's given access to vulnerable people that he can take advantage of. I don't think it's a coincidence he picks places where people were physically or mentally ill, or in the case of prisons or schools for children who broke the law, those are people along with the mentally ill that are least likely to be believed. Savile was no doubt logically aware of that, however I don't think that's the entire picture. But starting with the fundraisers and everything, the endless marathons, endless events, why does anyone do such things? For altruistic reasons you'd hope that's part of it, I would doubt that in Savile's case, so why else? There's firstly the argument the documentary was clear to present, which was to feel he'd done some good. There are numerous examples of Savile explaining in interviews that, as a devout Catholic, when he went to the pearly gates he wanted to have a big list of good things he'd done to counteract whatever sins which we now know were enormous. And I don't doubt he thought that. He may not have had empathy or remorse for what he did, but he probably still understood his actions consciously as bad, and particularly if he was a devout Catholic, that probably did bother him. The only time you punish yourself is when you are with young ladies, and then you punish yourself because you're such a villain. What is that? You should be kind to them and you're not kind to them, and you squeeze them and make them go ouch and things like that. There's a lot of things to say about that quote, as well as the question that preceded it. Right now I think that quote tells us very clearly he knew what he was doing was morally bad, and if the suggestion is true that he died with both his fingers crossed, then yes, I think trying to do some good in an attempt to curry favour with gods, or at the least give himself an excuse to feel absolved in life, would be some form of motivation. But really I think his charity work is about getting to feel adored. One thing we know very clearly about Savile is that he was a narcissist. Really he's the dark triad of personality as it's called, which as far as I can see from the very few articles and such there are discussing Savile's psychology, people unanimously agree he was the dark triad, which is narcissism, Machiavellianism and psychopathy. But what do we know about narcissists? They like to feed their ego, and honestly, what better method can you possibly think of to do that than publicly raising large sums of money for charity? It's pretty much perfect for that. Everybody loves people donating to charity and will praise you like a saint for it. If you donate your own money, then people start to question why you do it publicly, why not just privately donate, but 
if you raise the money and work very hard to raise that money, nobody has any complaints. You are 100% adored for it, which is kind of odd when you think about it. The other conscious reason for the charity work, of course, is it creates a cover. We can't forget that point. But I think the common misconception about narcissists is that they all think they're brilliant, incredible people, which I guess is true technically but I guess not deep down. They don't think they're brilliant due to high self-esteem for example. I think people with good self-esteem are often secure enough to recognise their faults. They don't think they're brilliant, they think they're good enough. Narcissists however actually have a very fragile self-esteem. So fragile that they can't even think on it. They have to shut it down completely and create this total hollow shell of an image. They're very keen on their image and how people view them rather than how they actually are. I think I'm worthless deep down, I don't believe I can change that, therefore how can I make myself look worthy? How can I make other people think of me as worthy? Maybe if I look good to them and they see me that way I'll start to feel it about myself. But the thing is, of course, technically it doesn't make them feel any better because the sense of self is shut away too far for anyone's praise or kindness or warmth to really reach it. It just reaches the ego instead, like this outer shell. Years and years ago I wrote this short story about a man who's become the CEO of a company and he wants this bright golden hair to go along with his new title and his new office chair in order that it would make him finally feel like a proper CEO of his company. Only this is a magical golden hair he gets from I think it was a witch or something and it grows so so fast on his head and the strands grow so strong that he can't cut them and they all end up growing down his entire body and encasing him in a metal cage. That was kind of a story about narcissism I wrote, um, based on an old boss in an old job. And this isn't the time to discuss that. The point is, because any of the positive experiences that might ordinarily help build a person's self-esteem, because none of that reaches the tightly guarded heart here, it has very little effect. It just becomes evidence to prop up what they feel is a lie. I am amazing rather than proof to actually go, no, it isn't a lie, you don't have to feel that way. Because of that, because it's just evidence to prop up something, the narcissist is likely to be forever seeking more and more of that evidence, more adoration, more detail to this image they're constructing, more success and fame. You know, in the admittedly not great example that that short story was, a narcissist who becomes the CEO of a business might have an image in their head of how CEOs are supposed to look, so they'll do everything they can to try and fit that image, because maybe then they could feel good about themselves. And so here we get Savile chasing more and more success and fame and going to incredibly extreme measures with his charity work to keep that adoration going, stop it from slipping as he fears, stop him from being forgotten massively fears, in fact. When I think about his 19 year run presenting the show Jim Will Fix It, a show in which children send in their wishes and he finds a way to fix them so that they can feel like they fly or whatever it is, it's a show that also fixes it for him to feel like a miracle worker. Jimmy Savile was terrified of losing all his adoration and again he has a very clear conscious reason to fear that, he was doing horrible horrible things. However there have been other people in the world who have done horrible things but don't fear the loss of adoration to the extreme he did. Savile's often talking about his business as a flash game. That in my line of business that I'd chosen which was a flash game, a posing game, a candy floss game, a phenomenon. A line of work that can be over in a second, basically. He actually talks here about having a Rolls Royce and how the image of being someone who drives a Rolls Royce helped him. And on the occasion he used to drive down in it, it made a tremendous difference, so I saw that as a tool of the trade. Even when asked if he enjoyed driving Rolls Royces, Havel says he loved it, but not for the sensation of driving the car, but because of that image. Did you enjoy the Rolls Royce? Loved it. You enjoyed sitting oh, yeah, in yeah, and driving Big posing it. job. Big posing job. His line of business is a posing game. But um, he intensely feared the loss of this image because not having that, all he's left with is the feelings of worthlessness that he's been trying to run from all his life. And the story he tells here about the Rolls Royces is that he keeps on selling his old ones and buying a new one over and over. I'm still in a phenomenon business. I can go skint in a day. I can be finished like that. I'd much rather go skint with a brand new Rolls Royce in the garage 
than one that's eight years old that I love because I'll get more for it. So there's a terribly strange and meticulous care to make sure that the car he's always driving is a new one in perfect condition that could always be sold for a lot in the instance he loses everything and has nothing left but the car. In many ways that is kind of logical and as I say he has a very clear reason to fear losing everything but the intensity of that fear to be constantly committing to something like this, especially for a man who had no remorse or guilt for his actions, I think that tells you his fear is a deeper, more internal one than just one based on his actions. Which brings us back to the quote earlier and the question I mentioned that preceded it. Always doing something physical like cycling or wrestling or something like that. Are you in some way trying to punish yourself? I think that is a very, very insightful question for a reporter to ask. And I think Savile's response indicates yes, he seems to have a habit of making this um, ho 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 sort of noise when he feels a bit stung by a comment. He does it a lot, and it's like he's trying to get his bearings. <laughs> Not at all. Find a clever way to answer the question, find a very rational way to shut it out, if that makes sense. There's actually a whole array of defensive tactics he employs in his interviews to stop things getting too personal. Some of them quite simple, such as in the interview for the radio show In the Psychiatrist's Chair with Anthony Clare, he'll answer a question factually and quickly before then running off into a tangent about a very intellectually philosophic but emotionally lacking point. For example, when asked about how close he was to his father, Savile responds, As close as you could be. Uh, you're, at that age, you don't understand closeness. Mm -hmm. You don't understand closeness. You only understand closeness when you haven't got it. Mm. Which, you know, quickly veers the conversation into the direction of how you only notice things once they're gone, which I guess could be an emotional point to make, but it's more just an empty intellectual point in this instance. One that manoeuvres him away from actually having to answer the question. He also seemed to have a big set of rehearsed anecdotes he could use to seem like he was revealing something about his past without actually really having to reveal much at all. Perhaps the most striking example of defensiveness in interviews was him storing a banana in his pocket before he went out for the show this is your life so that he could pull it out and randomly eat it like a strange gimmick to distract the audience and interviewer when he most needed to distract them all my mother ever told me was not to eat while i was talking but that was another issue <laughs> um why have you shied away from close relationships with women i'm quite happy to have a few close relationships tonight if anybody's not spoken for but anyway, you see him stalling for time here, trying to get his bearings as though the interviewer hits uncomfortably close to the truth and he needs to find a way to steer things away. And then, responding with a mention of these young ladies he behaves as a villain to, in his words, I think that is an attempt to make a joke, because he regularly turns all his assaults into weird creepy jokes as though it's just some comedy persona and we'll talk about him doing that later in the video but I think this is an attempt to make another one of those jokes but how little even comedic attempt he puts into the execution of it here I think shows just how stung he genuinely is by the question it's completely thrown him and he ends up rambling something that's uncomfortably true. The only time you punish yourself is when you are with young ladies then you punish yourself because you're such a villain. So in that sense, I do think all this intense work he does is punishing himself. Perhaps even part of his intense fear he's going to lose everything is also probably punishing himself in a psychological way. Savile took part in professional wrestling where he lost his first 35 matches and suffered various broken bones. I mean, that's certainly punishing yourself if you go 35 times without winning and still carry on. No, I don't think punishment is the only reason for any of that no it's probably not the main reason i wouldn't imagine is he punishing himself because he's such a villain to young ladies i hate the wording of that i'm just consciously aware youtube might take issue if i say words like abuse too often i should think he's more punishing himself because of a deeper feeling of self-hatred though stretching back far beyond any of this i imagine in his mind, the abuse isn't what made him a villain. He feels he was already one, much as the grandiose image he tries to create might help him escape from that, but he was already one that already deserved punishment. This behaviour is simply further evidence in his mind to prove that. Let's um, touch on his childhood a little in relation to all of this so far. 
The main thing we know about his childhood is his mother, who I've devoted an entire section of this video to later on. She's going to be the key thing, and we'll get to that then. What we also know, the thing Savile does mention a fair few times in interviews, is that he was the seventh child in the family, the youngest of a long line. Because I was what I've come to call a not-again child. Now, a not-again child is when the Duchess told all her Chinas that she was up the tub, uh, they'd say, not again. <laughs> You see, so I finished up as a not-again child. He makes various comments at points to suggest that behind these other six children who got more attention than him, Jimmy Savile was neglected. My guess is that they were all neglected, but that, in his mind, whether true or not, he suffered the worst of it all. Which, even if it isn't true, tells you he did suffer neglect. Another interesting quote from his interview with the psychiatrist, Anthony Clare, was that... When I was very, very young, being the youngest of seven, I had uh, big ears and no mouth mm. because nobody listens to you when you're the youngest of a family anyway so you finish up listening. Which is a very striking way to describe it. No mouth. That is probably an important idea when we come on to his actions but this is a boy who felt he had no voice whatsoever if we can draw full meaning from one phrase he used in one interview which we can't but Based on his character, I wouldn't be surprised if he did feel that growing up. Anyone who suffered neglect growing up has a good chance of struggling with low self-esteem, although I think in this more extreme case it's more than just self-esteem. Self-esteem makes it sound like a simple confidence issue. And being neglected by his parents denied his natural need at a very young age. A child has to come to some sort of conclusion for why that is. Because it's so much more scary when you're completely unsure why. It seems like Savile's conclusion was probably that it's because he was the last of a big family. All my siblings are bigger and better than me, therefore they got the attention. And then the child might wonder, how can I get some attention then? My siblings are all clearly bigger and better than me, so I can't win there. How can I make myself seem bigger and better then? And that really is conjecture, but we do have a boy who feels he has no voice whatsoever that then grows into a man doing everything he can to get his voice absolutely everywhere, to be plastered all over television. And also a very manipulative, cunning, deceptive man to the Machiavellian side of him. I suspect he learned early on that the best way, as he saw it, to get his parents' attention, or what he sought instead if he'd given up on their attention, was through deceptive means. As I say, as stands true for all of this video, it's not this clear-cut correlation, his parents neglected him, therefore this happened. That would be a crazy suggestion to make, but still there is likely some link. Although we do need to discuss further factors. What's the thing that really stands out for Jimmy Savile, the brand or so, the thing that made people remember him on television? Is it anything to do with his personality? No, it's that he had zany hair and glasses and clothes. That's what he decided would make him the most interesting, not who he is as a person, but this image. We're going to talk about death now though, which is where I think we start to get into things a little deeper. I was trying to look at the timeline of Jimmy Savile's life to pinpoint if there were any major events around the time he first started, and it's very hard to do so because for any victim to come forwards, especially 70 odd years ago, is a near insurmountable task. Mostly, apart from a few small reports, his victims only came forwards after his death once a documentary was released in 2011, but there could have been countless victims who either still weren't able to say what happened to them, or had died before 2011 in that stretch of 50 or 60 years. What that means is the first reported incident we know of was in 1955. They might have been earlier, they might not have been, we don't know. Savile's father died two years prior to that in April 1953. Is there a connection? 
we'll never know, so it's better to conclude no rather than yes, but there's that for you anyway. That was as far as my attempts to pinpoint major life events got. There was a phrase used of Jimmy Savile in one of the articles I was reading for background information. Savile's long and sinister fixation with death. Now I can't say from what I've watched of Savile's interviews and things in the documentary and stuff that he did say a great deal about death, however it's probably safe to assume this journalist knows more than me, and we can build on the idea with a fair degree of evidence. His ever-looming fear about losing everything. On a more unconscious level that could most certainly be linked to a fear of death, his need for fame and the lasting image, his fairly regular talk about having a list of good deeds to show God when he goes to heaven. You might even very loosely wonder if his devout Catholicism was influenced by a fixation with death and a desire to make sense of it. That is just very loose wondering though. He was raised Catholic after all, and when his mother was passionately Catholic and he ever keen to please her, I suspect that's a factor there. But what we do know in terms of Savile's relation to death are three key things. One is that he spent a huge deal of time as a child wandering about the wards and corridors of St. Joseph's home for the aged. Second, Jimmy Savile had a near-death experience when he was very young and also possibly a near-death experience when he was a teenager, and thirdly, his father dying when he was still a young adult. The St. Joseph's home for the aged though. It was both just across the road from his house, and his father was also the trustee of it, which I think means either his dad dragged him along there to keep an eye on him while he ran the place, or um, Savile decided to go over there himself in an effort to try and spend some time with his father, or to understand his father. What it definitely means though is that we have a little boy whose childhood was spent not climbing trees or seeing friends, but seeing lots of ill people in hospital beds constantly passing away. I mean that would burn the impermanence of life and the ever possible threat of death quite vividly into your mind. They were always dying, he said of the elderly residents. The nuns would say, why don't you go downstairs and say goodbye to her? He told me he enjoyed getting to ride in the hearse for the funerals. There's also one bizarre story in the documentary actually, in which a reporter relates how Savile told him when volunteering and helping the paramedics there was a car crash in which someone's decapitated head had gone underneath a car, and almost proudly Savile spoke about how he volunteered to go under and fetch it and pull this head out. There's also quite a few reports of him in the morgue uh, having sex with the bodies or messing about with them. But if we go back to his childhood experience in this care home, I think that sort of experience as a kid could cause all sorts of problems in different ways, but I would just say it's an experience of very fleeting relationships to other people. Constantly saying goodbye to the elderly he may barely have just learned the names of, that experience bears a striking resemblance to the fact Jimmy Savile went through life with endless fleeting relationships to everybody. Nobody ever got to know him closely, he was always travelling to different places, never stayed longer than two nights in the same place, didn't really have a team of people around him, the only person he kept a permanent relationship with seems to be his mother, so that's key. The other thing is, from what it sounds like, this care home robbed him of his childhood in a literal sense, as well I think as psychologically. Robbed of the youthful carefree innocence children tend to have, where experiences of death aren't something they consciously tend to have at the forefront of their minds. You know, ordinary children, whilst they obviously know what death is, hope to be lucky enough not to have to think particularly deeply about it, or if they do, it's hopefully in singular experiences like pets or a relative dying, and you have people's support to help you slowly work through that experience. Being surrounded by death though, and even more simply being surrounded by old people, not children your own age to muck about with. Obviously you went to school, it would be interesting to know more about that, but um, I wonder if you could even go further and say, along with the abusive treatment his mother definitely gave him, which we'll get to, did he have a very stunted emotional development, never really getting the childhood we all need to develop healthily? I don't know, perhaps. But if you do think about him as someone robbed of his childhood, I suppose it's then not really surprising that he says with such conviction that he hated children. Hate him? Really, seriously? Which, you know, is a striking thing for someone 
perhaps most famous for a long-running children's program to admit in a public interview. That quote makes me wonder if he saw in other children something he never had himself, which perhaps is youth depending on how he'd emotionally interpret youth and innocence, often being quite an illusory thing projected onto children which I imagine would be part of it. At least the innocence of not knowing about death, not having that at the forefront of your mind, being far less pressed by that suffocating fear as Savile may have been. As horrible as this is to consider, and I don't like to say this kind of thing when I might be completely wrong, but in light of all that, if there's one thing Jimmy Savile did to his predominantly underage victims, it's robbed them of their innocence. Which isn't a sentence I want to dwell on. I don't like considering points like that when the nature of this video forces me to consider them from his perspective rather than his victims. That makes it feel like I'm having to hold back my empathy for his victims, which isn't a nice thing to feel. Everything they've gone through is awful and I feel like I should be making videos to promote empathy for them and it feels strange to be doing something that is contrary to that. Um, but as I've said, it's important to try and understand these people and to be able to recognise them and understand where they come from. The second point I mentioned about death was that when Jimmy Savile was two, he caught pneumonia and was close enough to death for the doctor to essentially give up and tell them to make their goodbyes, only for his mother to take him to church with her where he quite miraculously just seemed to recover. The doctor said in the end, he said, well, I won't come again, Mr. Savile. He said, um, let me know when Jimmy dies and I'll send you a death certificate. We're great believers in prayer. Quarter to three when I was in the cathedral, immediately Jimmy went to sleep and woke up normal. Which when you think about that, perhaps it's no wonder he was a devout Catholic. Whether or how true that story actually is, I think is kind of irrelevant because it was true to him. It's what his mum always said, it's what he grew up believing about himself. And so I tried to understand what a story like that might mean to a child. One is a possible total feeling of helplessness, the powerlessness of being close to death and there being nothing you yourself can do to prevent it, perhaps even a dependence on God. Powerlessness and helplessness will be feelings we discuss later on. Another possible point is actually the complete reverse of that, a feeling of invincibility, which may partially arise as a defence against the powerless feelings, a kind of omnipotent imagined power, I couldn't be killed. I am unstoppable, which may also then link to the teenage Savile working in the mines and being hit with an explosion bad enough to require three years of recovery yet still did not kill him or permanently injure him. Does he come out of all of that with a belief of invincibility? Can we even perhaps link that to the many assaults in public places and how he even regularly jokes or made comments hinting at his assaults in interviews, a total brazen taunt of invincibility, which makes it even more awful to consider that he did get away with all of this. You don't do that if you don't feel invincible, I don't think, or perhaps most fittingly if you don't feel the need to feel invincible. We'll discuss Savile's need to feel powerful soon, which of course links to the need to feel adored and successful as well. So I guess the need to feel invincible as a defence, maybe against this intense fear of losing everything and possibly of death. To grow up watching countless people die while surviving your own near-death experience could tell you I am invincible where they were not, or it could say I am under massive threat of the same thing happening to me, I have barely escaped it. Doing everything I can to make myself feel invincible will spare me feeling so threatened in the future. And the third thing I mentioned was his father's death, but Jimmy Savile gives us next to no information about his dad whatsoever, which um, definitely tells you there's something there he doesn't want to think about, and you can speculate what that might be, but with next to no evidence it's impossible to really say. Some of you may have noticed the obvious link between Savile spending his childhood wandering round a care home and Savile spending his adulthood volunteering at hospitals and care homes. As I said, it wasn't just a sinister, rational reason he spent so much time in those places as an adult. It's also what he's familiar with, and 
if there was any part of him attempting to replicate his dad's role in that care home, then it was probably also that. In fact, we know at least two of Savile's siblings also worked in hospitals at points, at least one, if not both of which, also carried out sexual harassment or assault. Which is a startling fact to discover. Johnny Savile was fired from working in a hospital for gross misconduct against a nurse, Vince Savile volunteered in a children's ward and, of a man who knew him well, reported Vince had a coterie of teenage girls, some of whom stayed at his house and ran errands for him. I can't believe the documentary made no mention of this, and I can't believe how, of the few articles I have read about Jimmy Savile, so many of them discuss the importance of him being the seventh child as a dominant factor in how he became the man he was, but if his older siblings show at least some similarity to their brother, then that can't be the dominant factor. So what might be the dominant factor? Let's talk about his mother. Annoyingly, when I started work on this video, I tried to find all the old papers I studied when I was in training, and I couldn't find a lot of them. But I did find um, one paper by Paul Akami and Amy Goldberg that I'll list in the bibliography, suggesting that sex offenders against minors were noted fairly consistently to have experienced early disturbances in mother relationships. And whilst we do have very few specifics about Savile's relationship to his mother, we know it most certainly was not healthy. I think the most glaring indication of which is the fact he referred to her as the Duchess rather than his mum, and not in a joking nickname sort of way, but in interviews too, he consistently seems to call her the Duchess with a level of seriousness. This is someone emotionally removed enough to be seen just as an authority figure rather than a maternal presence. You didn't know I was on the way then? No. That means you didn't really want me then? Oh, I wanted you when I knew. Why did you beat me so much in my youth then? I didn't beat you enough. You didn't beat me enough? No. Ladies and gentlemen. Spare the rod and spoil the child, and that was the oh. case with you. What we definitely know of Agnes Savile is that she was very emotionally cold and an incredibly formidable presence. This is someone who, despite all her son's riches and fame and success, never once watched any of his appearances on television, never showed any interest in any of it, or if she did, she pretended not to, which is incredibly extreme. Agnes Savile was a figure of absolute power over her children who, it seems, used that power to shame, humiliate, and leave them feeling entirely helpless. There are descriptions made of Savile in a Netflix documentary desperately trying to win his mother's affection or acknowledgement. The difficult thing about that situation is you're likely to have a great deal of frustration and anger towards your mother for ignoring you, for making you feel like this child with big eyes, big ears, and no mouth, but you can't express any of that anger towards her because that comes with the fear that then she'd really shut you out, the worry that it would only make things worse, so you have to keep all of that anger inside and try your very best to please her but endlessly fail and just feel powerless beneath her. You can't win. So not just is this the seventh child of a family, not just was he surrounded by death and close to it himself, but his mother also very likely made him feel incredibly powerless and kind of non-existent in a way. I think particularly of babies when they're newly born, there's a kind of um, psychological death they fear and a non-existence when they are neglected and out of their carers' minds. More than anything, research suggests sexual assault is about power. Much more about power than it is about sex itself, and the impression I get from the harrowing stories I won't share of Savile's treatment of his victims is that he didn't always orgasm, wasn't always able to, that side of it was secondary to the experience of taking away another person's power and voice and making them feel painfully helpless. It's horrible to consider that one man, rather than able or even try processing the feelings of powerlessness, would instead project all of it onto his many victims. And when you consider those victims were predominantly female, perhaps release all anger and hatred he had for his mum onto them instead. Or perhaps more accurately, identify with his mother in those experiences and look on his victims like his child self. A person he hates and wishes to attack, because if there's one person he had more anger for than his mother, it's probably himself for being so powerless beneath her. Um, there are... A few quotes about his mum from the Anthony Clare interview that are worth bringing up here. When I came into a few quid and I suddenly realised 
that I could actually have a better time teaming her about with me than I could team in a, a girl about with me. As against the Duchess brought me up for the first part of my life mm. and I brought up her, yeah. her up for the second part of yeah. her life. You said the five days that you spent with her after she was dead were the happiest days of your life. Once upon a time I had to share it with a lot of people. We had marvellous times, but when she was dead she was all mine, for me. So therefore, mm. it finished up right. The first obvious thing to note about these quotes is that Savile is very keen to assert he was the one with the power once he got older. He brought her up, she was dependent on him for care and financial support. He bought her a new house and car and she had what he calls a ghost payroll, by which he means she deviously came up with all sorts of fake people that she claimed she needed to pay money to for whatever jobs and her son would pay her that money that she would then keep for herself, which you may notice the second obvious thing then is that whilst he may assert he had the power, it still kind of sounds like she did. No matter what he paid her, he was still seeking an approval that he never found. It's hard to say when we can't exactly say how this whole ghost payroll thing was carried out, but I imagine it could be a very good way for Agnes to get funds from her son without having to feel dependent or having to say thank you to him. You know, it's not, I don't have enough money, please can you help? It's just, these people need paying, sort it out for me. The third thing to note, I think, is the possessive quality, especially in the case of his dead mother being all his. That is symbolically owning and possessing that which has always been beyond him, that which he has been seeking and has been plagued with hatred due to being denied, his mother's love and approval. He may have never got that from her, but perhaps in his eyes this is the next best thing, possessing her, in a very literal sense. If Savile never really did experience love, or not enough, then it does make it pretty much impossible for him to understand what it is, but also makes it terrifyingly unfamiliar to him. If you've never once had that closeness to anybody, if you're used to a total emotional distance, transient fleeting friendships and interactions, and even in the symbolic sense, this was a man who did not spend more than two nights in the same place, liked to regularly replace his old cars with new ones, you know, um, symbolically, that's a man who can't bear emotional attachment to anything, not even to objects or places. So if he is used to emotional distance like that, the idea of any hint of closeness would be alien and scary, and something probably to push away, even if he might desire it at the same time. And it's out of that idea I want to make another uncomfortable point. For a man who might desire the kind of closeness his mother starved him of, and so also fear it, perhaps instead a more twisted idea of affection corrupted by experiences of power may take its place. The idea not to be close to anything but to possess, as though it were a concrete object to take and then throw away like his old cars or old homes he once stayed in, is that how he saw his victims? I think all of Savile's interviews are very chilling to watch. The most chilling quality I find is the jokes he makes and all the innuendo. I don't think I need to play it, I think it's enough for me to say he's near constantly making jokes about himself as someone who always is having flings with women. That he does sometimes just make sound like he's a desirable man who flirts constantly and I guess it kind of draws on the sort of comedy persona Pepe Le Pew was back in the day. A character we obviously take issue with now for very clear reasons, but I think back then that was a kind of thing that was accepted and found funny. But so at times he leans into this idea of being a desirable man who flirts consensually and has lots of women coming to him and things, and at other times he leans further into this supposedly comedic persona that he's a creep. You used to be a wrestler, didn't you? Is that right? I still am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm feared in every girls' school in this country. <laughs> and all the presenters laugh, because they don't take it seriously. I guess that's what's so disturbingly clever about it, by playing off his sinister side like it is just some comedy persona, 
people become inclined to take the serious allegations less seriously. They just see it as part of this persona. And more so, I guess, they laugh in the interviews and on TV and things because it's their job to try and make the TV look as light-hearted and fun as possible. And yeah, perhaps also because that kind of innuendo and that kind of humour was more common back then, who knows. The point is, there are examples of him not just making jokes, but also creepily leering and attempting to flirt with the female presenters live on TV. You know, all this schmooze in the early morning, it's, it's really, that... I'm unused to it. <laughs> need lots of schmooze. Train with girls. I'm afraid so, yes. They're faster than me, so they run in front of me. So therefore the pain is intense, but the view is magnificent. <laughs> in the case of that point, there is an attempt in it, I think. Savile trying to feel like he is someone desirable, someone that other people would want, like he can successfully flirt with women. And obviously the example we see there is live on camera, so it's very different to what he did off camera, but there is still a desperate relentlessness to his attempts at flirting with the female presenters. Would it help him shirk the sense of guilt and sin if he was to pretend to himself that he was desirable, that others came to him and wanted him, not the other way around? Is that it? Or is there a side of him desiring warmth, desperate for this presenter to want him, to feel wanted in all the ways his mother never made him feel? Um, perhaps? I don't exactly know what the motivation was there, but I think there's enough to say there was a side of Savile that wanted to believe he was a ladies' man, but he was not. Um, we're going to move on now. There's two more things I want to discuss about his psychology, and then I'll try and wrap this up with a safe sort of downtime-style ending that will help us all. I myself definitely need downtime after recording this. We're almost there. I think the most striking thing I found spending an uncomfortably long time thinking about this man is that I still have no idea what his personality was. Sure, he's very extroverted, he's narcissistic, devious, cunning, charismatic with a high level of cognitive empathy, all those sorts of things, but you don't get an intuitive sense of anyone, he just sort of reads like a bullet point of character traits rather than a character you actually know. And I think that's more than just him trying to hide his crimes behind a smokescreen of lies, I think there's an emptiness to him. It was something I'd been wondering about since it was mentioned in a documentary early on that he once described himself as a machine. He didn't have, he wasn't emotional about anything. He told me it was the most profound statement, I'm a machine. Only what? The man who gets up, works tirelessly, moves town, works more, does shows, marathons, fundraising. It's not saying that in a kind of praising way, wow, you're a machine for being able to do this work, but it's more like, where's the humanity? I'm a robot without a heart or a soul sort of feeling. It's the Anthony Clare interview where he really hits the nail on the head as far as I see it, because there's a long section of that interview where Anthony Clare is trying to learn about Jimmy Savile the person, and... He asks if anybody really knows him, and Savile has this kind of repeated phrase to dodge all the questions. What you see is what you get. That would make me bad news from a psychiatrist or a psychologist, because there's nothing to find. What you see is what there is. And no matter what questions Anthony Clare asks, whether it's what do you do in your free time and freedom, do you have close relationships to anyone, Savile always just dodges going any deeper by repeating the idea that what you see is what you get. Everybody knows me, I am close to everyone, because all I am is what you immediately see. So what you see, what I see, is what you are. Yes. And in that sense, everybody who sees you knows you as yeah. much as they're ever likely to know you. And we know he says that because he's hiding a horrible, horrible secret, but of this repeated phrase, Anthony Clare also makes a hell of an insightful interpretation. The, the, the moral of this story <laughs> is that if we search for something inside you, we will not find anything. And I think he's exactly right. Not we won't be able to find anything deeper because you hide it too well, but what we will find is nothing. A total inner emptiness, because nothing is there. And I think that's exactly what Savile, though entirely unconscious, was really expressing about himself there. I feel entirely empty, a total void. Perhaps it's no wonder in that sense that nobody gets to know him, nobody gets the sense of a real him. No wonder he describes himself as a machine, no wonder he's so intensely obsessed with image. 
he doesn't feel there's any more substance to himself, which I actually think kind of makes him feel more frightening. A man like a hollow shell who feels he needs to create an image to make up for the total void behind it. And when there are many journalists and interviewers who spend time with Savile trying to understand him, such as Louis Farouk most famously did, um, he sensed there was something dark to Savile, something off about the man, but he never got to the truth despite spending all this time with him, never figured it out, which I think this is a strong part of why you don't get any intuitive or emotional sense of a real person underneath so much as a total void. And I think that makes it harder to grasp at anything tangible and conscious when you do have a palpable feeling that you're staring into an abyss. I could be completely wrong because I never met him, I can't pick up any form of transference or counter-transference, but I get the feeling if there's one thing Savile is projecting onto the interviewers he encounters, it's a strong feeling he had of inner emptiness. The fact nobody can find anything concrete to him inside, perhaps that's the point. And I can try and grapple with some conjecture about where this comes from. I have this picture in my mind of a man lacking a psychic skin, as the phrase is. Denied parental figures that could help him develop a capacity to contain his emotions and process his feelings within. We need to be able to contain feelings, not just to be able to make sense of them, but there is a visual image of yourself like a safe container, a solid box that can hold on to these feelings and ideas within you, and internal world that has this layer of psychic skin to protect it from the external world, you know, your border, boundary, a sense of self where you begin and where the world around you begins. And whilst we do always partly merge with other things outside of ourselves, and you can argue in a spiritual sense maybe, I suppose, that we're in everything, you still nonetheless I think need some sense of an emotional self and your border, it feels safe if nothing else. Lacking a psychic skin you'd be a bit like a leaky container, one with holes that tries to hold everything in but it spills away constantly and you just feel like you're falling apart, nothing to hold that emotional self together. Which would be frightening and perhaps adds to why Savile might have been so fixated and frightened of death, because feeling like this leaky container himself there could be an ever-present fear of psychological death. Unable to contain anything inside, Savile becomes no one in his own mind, non-existent, this empty machine, image without substance. I think that's kind of how I'm viewing things at the moment, which is difficult for me to discuss because this is a person so far outside my specialist area, and it would be nice if anyone was able to comment more and let me know if I'm running somewhere along the right line here or not. I don't know. Um, there is a quote from Dr. Faisal actually in a Channel 4 article saying, Savile's offending does not appear to be motivated solely by sexual urges, but rather by a lack of boundaries, both internal and external. Unfortunately, there's not, unfortunately, there's not much more Dr. Faisal says in that article, and I can't find any mention of it anywhere else, but I think whilst I haven't entirely wrapped my head around the point, this is what I'm driving at, a lack of internal and external boundaries, a leaky psychic container that then bleeds out into everything else, no rigidity, no structure and stability and constant to any of his life, just new home after new home, new cars, new objects, nothing but his image and his impulses. And the idea of leaking out into everything else, if I am right about that, I don't know. Um, it is uncontained sense of self invading other people's, lacking a feel of his own borders and boundaries to defend and contain himself, he invades other people's, leaves them feeling lacking in boundaries and horribly defenceless. That's as far as I'm going to go with that point, but I suppose it does link to a quick point I want to discuss next. I think we need to gradually start winding this down though. It isn't just inner psychological boundaries that I think Savile was lacking. Psychological boundaries that often takes your mother's or caregiver's attentive, thoughtful attempts to contain your earliest feelings for you. You see them trying to make sense of your feelings and that kind of teaches you the process to do it yourself sort of thing. Um, containment, essentially. 
it's worth reading up about if you want to, I'll likely devote a video to it at some point. Savile, with what we know of his mother, probably didn't give him that experience. We don't know of his father. The only time she did show any closeness to him, actually, was when he was ill and dying, suddenly then... Which I guess then is an experience only of closeness when there is a link directly to your own vulnerability and the powerlessness and threat of death, which is hardly very positive. But the other kind of boundary Savile lacked was the ordinary social constraints of the law and social expectations, you know? Um, most people wouldn't just be allowed to come into hospitals and work doing whatever they like there, but Savile was famous and a beloved TV star, and that probably both charmed the hospital elite, and he donated generous amounts of money to them. Insane as it is to imagine, the government even appointed him to manage over Broadmoor Hospital in total control with the authority to overall senior staff. That is insane. Um, most people wouldn't be allowed to drive off with children from a special school, but Savile was famous for his TV show of making children's dreams come true, and if he says he's taking them out for a nice time at the beach, people either believed him or turned a blind eye to the truth. More than anything, this is a man with huge wealth, social power in the sense the public loved him and in the sense he had close connections to the police, the prime minister and the royal family. It seems all limits and boundaries you would hope would be in place, Savile just surpassed them with alarming ease and I think, if anything, the lack of boundaries would have fed his sense of entitlement. When I think about all the taunting Savile did in his interviews, all the jokes that hint at the dark truth, I think it seems like two different things simultaneously. One is the delight at everything he can get away with, a kind of triumphant sense of power. As I said earlier, pushing things as far as he can to make himself feel more invincible. I think in his taunts there is that triumphant feeling of victory and power, but also probably a side of him that wants to be caught and wants to be punished. And it's only a side of him because there's another side terribly afraid about being caught and would do anything it could to resist it. Savile believed in sin though, he no doubt feared hell and I imagine wanted some reason, some explanation he could give for why he does the things he does. One of which he did say very clearly in his interviews as I already discussed, he did all this good charity work, hopefully that balances things out, which it obviously doesn't. But I imagine more crucially, the reason or excuse he clung to the most was that I couldn't stop myself. I wanted to be stopped, I wanted to be caught, but I never had any boundaries in place. I'm almost certain that's the conclusion Savile himself came to about his behaviour, and perhaps it could be partly accurate, but I also feel in telling himself, I can't stop it, I need someone else to stop it for me, that's basically an excuse that gives him reason to keep continuing and to not try and stop himself, if that makes sense. There's an interesting description he gives of patients in Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital that feels more like he is speaking about himself. There are people who break the law knowingly because they're in full possession of their faculties, and people who create something which is a breaking of the law when they were possessed by something or somebody, some evil spirit or whatever. It sounds a bit dramatic, but that's... Uh, an easy way of describing it. We do know Savile was an incredibly impulsive man. Narcissists and psychopaths often are impulsive people. A lot of his assaults, again, I don't want to describe them, appear to be impulsive actions. If, and I mean if, there was a side of Savile that did want to stop what he was doing, then the answer he gave himself was that he couldn't stop, he was powerless to. He needed someone else to stop him, take his power away and put him back in that helpless, powerless, familiar position he began life, because that would have been more familiar to him, to be shamed and powerless. To feel he was powerful and invincible may have been what he wanted, and may have partly felt triumphant, but also dizzyingly uncertain and scary, I'd suspect. Like standing atop a gigantic tower with a stormy wind all around you, making it feel dangerously easy to fall. All this power perhaps made him feel more out of control and unsafe than ever, and whilst he certainly feared being caught, doesn't mean he didn't partly, unconsciously behave to make his fears become reality, except they never did become reality. Despite all manner of indications and evidence out there that anyone could ever need to know what he was doing, he was never caught, and that is 
genuinely a disgrace. In my experience of assessing and treating many, many such individuals over the last 25 years, they themselves feel the only way for them to benefit from treatment is to also be punished. And their attitude tends to be, thank goodness I was caught because I couldn't stop myself. The tough thing in life is ultimate freedom. That's when the battle starts. Mm. I like to think if I, if I actually said uh, that I'm very strong, well, only because I've managed to handle mm. complete and ultimate, utter freedom. He, of course, didn't handle ultimate freedom at all. For him, ultimate freedom was just another borderless, boundaryless, leaky container to spill through. He can't admit in that interview that he hasn't handled ultimate freedom, but for the quite long section of the Anthony Clare interview where he presses the point about how scary and dangerous ultimate freedom is, I think that says enough. Jimmy Savile was a narcissistic, psychopathic, Machiavellian, dangerous man who did so much bad for so long. I've attempted to understand why, but ultimately we always knew this attempt would fall short. We know there are plenty of people who might suffer very similar experiences and yet don't fall into any of this. And I briefly mentioned um, in my video on Joker how villainy, although definitely not this kind of villainy, almost gets glorified in films and media at times as though it's some logical path that all extremely mentally ill people turn to, but it's not. Those struggling with mental health issues are far more likely to be vulnerable and the victims of others later in life, as for example so many of them were the victims of him. So I can try to link some of the dots, knowing what Savile did and attempting to find things in his behaviour and past experiences that might make sense of it, however that's all this is. Trying to join a few dots based on what we know is not the same as a complete and clear picture, and sometimes in my haste to find a link between the two I might even join the wrong dots together. I think we need some downtime now though, I don't want to summarise everything discussed with a big conclusion, I just want to take a chance to step back and breathe. So this has all been incredibly uncomfortable and possibly overwhelming. I hope you've all been able to manage this through to the end, but I do not blame you if you haven't. Um, it might be worth stopping for a second to reflect on how you feel, note any sensations, because I can vividly remember um, when we first had seminars to do with sexual abuse in my training, how my stomach felt in knots at certain points. We have been thinking about the things ordinarily so unbearable that society shuts it out, and that is not an easy thing to be able to do. You know, I told my dad I was making a video about Jimmy Savile, and he told me, are you sure that's going to be very controversial, nobody ever talks about him? And nobody wants to, of course they don't want to. There's, um, there's a side of British culture I think that prefers to pretend he just never happened, but that doesn't erase the experiences of those he abused, and it doesn't mean such people stop existing in the world. I think part of preventing such atrocities requires us to at least partly recognise them. I may be wrong here, because I wasn't born back then, but as far as I understand, this sort of thing wasn't exactly taken seriously in the 70s or 80s or whatever. Not in the public conscious, it was all just a cartoonish image of weird bearded people with glasses and long trench coats, at most viewed like this one dirty old man at the bottom of the street that everybody knows to avoid sort of thing, an image to half joke about. I think the idea then of a beloved celebrity abusing hundreds and hundreds of people in places that are public or supposed to be safe and as part of a probably bigger institution that is just not something to ever cross people's minds back then. It's entirely natural we don't like to think about any of this because it's a real painful darkness you can feel in the pit of your stomach, but the worst thing of all I think would be to be in a state of denial about it. The problem with denial and not wanting to think about this sort of thing is it could lean people against believing the victims of similar crimes in the future, and if the victims aren't believed or don't feel they would be believed, it's very hard for them to speak out and they're guilty to be prosecuted. 
As such, I do think we need a general cultural understanding that this sort of thing can happen, does happen, and that people need help. The more we can create a culture that support the survivors, the more power we have against it. That said, I think it's the truth when I say stories like these don't tend to interest me, because the stories I'm more interested in would be the stories of the survivors, of people who suffered trauma of whatever kind and had to struggle on to find healing, how difficult finding it may have been for them, how broken they may have felt and may still do at certain times, and how they found their way forwards. Because I don't think we hear enough of those stories. I think we need the sense of hope they provide. It's a hard task to expect anyone to think about the horror without helping them think about the healing also. Which at the very least I think helps other survivors to know that they're not alone. There are others going through the same struggle and we who could be good friends or partners to a survivor need to be open enough that they can come to us for support. I think in general as well we need the reminder that humanity has such a wonderful potential to heal. And it is a potential, not a guarantee, but an important potential all the same. A potential we as a world need to grow to make more likely and more of a guarantee. Healing is possible, and that possibility often comes down not to how strong a person is, whatever strength even means there, I don't know how you'd measure it, um, nor does it come down to how big or intense the traumatic experiences themselves were, so much as it comes down to the support you have around you. I think that's the most important factor in healing, and um, because it's a book I've been reading at the moment, I'm going to quote a few bits from the introduction to Bruce Perry's The Boy Who Was Raised As A Dog. Ultimately what determines how children survive trauma, physically, emotionally or psychologically, is whether the people around them, particularly the adults they should be able to trust and rely upon, stand by them with love, support and encouragement. That's the thing we've got to get better at. Making sure there are people available who can stand by those in need. Ideally that's the parents, if we're talking about children here, although this obviously isn't just about children. Um, and not every situation is ideal, sometimes we need other relatives, or friends, counsellors, support workers, teachers, carers, whatever it might be. Sometimes even finding a partner later into life, but making sure people have the support they need to really begin the difficult task of trying to heal. In terms of the love, support and encouragement such people can offer, I do think in general, we're getting better at that. I think the world's understanding of emotion and therapeutic experience is much stronger than a few decades ago, and I hope that continues. Even things like ordinary people understanding anxiety and depression and trauma much better. There's still a long way to go, obviously, but there's definitely been a lot of progress there. A lot of that, I think, comes down to the public being able to think about the difficult things rather than just shut them out in denial, but how to healthfully support someone, how to manage the difficult conversations, how to give people the best possible environment. All those sorts of things are important things people are learning more about, and I don't just mean logically seeking knowledge and advice, but hopefully a strengthened intuitive sense for how best to support a certain person in specific moments. Whilst it is very, very easy to feel bleak about the direction the world is going at the moment, I think this is one clear aspect where there has been solid consistent progress over the years. We're consistently getting better not just in the quality of therapy, but in society's general therapeutic understanding. So to quote Bruce Perry again, our work brings us into people's lives when they are most desperate, alone, sad, afraid and wounded, but for the most part the stories you'll read here are success stories. Stories of hope, survival, triumph. Surprisingly, it is often when wandering through the emotional carnage left by the worst of humankind that we find the best of humanity as well. And that is me talking about the survivors. It's important I said something about the survivors because so much of this video has been from Savile's perspective and I don't like how ignored that makes them feel in the course of this video. I know that's not what this video is for but it still makes me feel uneasy. Sexual abuse is an awful experience that a lot of the world is still in a shameful state of denial about but 
I think things are improving there. People are becoming more understanding as they very much need to be. And if that continues, I hope in another 10, 20 years or so we'll have made real progress there. But we do also have to wonder about people like Savile. We have a long way to go in order to prevent people of power being free to get away with such horrors secret from society. We know that from fairly recent news with other examples. I think stories are covered up a little less than they once were. I hope that's some kind of progress, that we at least actually hear a few of the allegations. That is still very minimal progress though, and not enough. But to think about Savile as a child, I might not be able to say what turned him from a vulnerable boy into what he became, however with enough progress done by people who are specialists, with enough growth in effective treatments, can such people be helped before they ever grow into such dangerous and dark adults? Yes. Can it be prevented? Yes. I think it already probably can be, but if progress continues, hopefully that prevention becomes more effective and society gets better at spotting who needs it and spotting it quickly. A lot of which I think does come down to things not being covered up, um, survivors being helped to find the courage they need to speak out, and a community or social systems more adept at spotting abuse and trauma and having the ability and funds to do something about it. And this is something else I like that I see firsthand in my job, uh, teachers being given training to understand trauma better and to try to spot it. So I think we're seeing the beginnings of that sort of thing developing, at least where I am in the world. Um, making this now, I realise that I don't have any videos on my channel about survivors of sexual abuse and their struggle to find healing. I think that feels like something I need to address now. However, I do have plenty of stories about people finding healing from other situations though. I mostly talk about films I'm passionate about and the psychology and emotion within those films and I think 9 times out of 10, whether the films be comedy or serious or whatever genre, they are stories in part about healing. That is what I'm most passionate about. But if you want something deeply life-affirming and hopeful and um, accurate, then I'm going to finish by recommending my Katie series. A set of videos I'm making based on a fictional case study written by a real clinical psychologist based on real experiences. A story that is incredibly moving and quite painful in its beginning, but ultimately a very triumphant, sweet and heartwarming story. The story of a little girl named Katie and how she found her healing. Beyond that, um, feel free to comment your thoughts, hopefully respectfully. I don't normally mention being respectful at the end of my videos, but I've been told making this one I should be careful about the comments. And I guess in that sense actually be aware it's possible YouTube's automatic system may remove some comments the way it's entirely possible YouTube may flag this entire video. We all know what YouTube is like about sensitive topics of discussion or using certain words too often, such as words that rhyme with great. So be aware of that, but all the same this video needs to be a discussion with you. Share your thoughts, your opinions, what I got wrong or missed, what you feel about this massive topic, how you're feeling now. Um, like the video if you appreciate it though, subscribe if you want hopefully less dark, more life-affirming videos in the future. Check out the analyses I've done on other characters from films or on my Katie series. Support me on Patreon if you want to help keep this channel going, but otherwise... Hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Janice McMahon, Luke Hoare, Chichu Kaber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Dustin Paulson, Samara Salsi, Sharon Cotterwet 14, Joshua C. Follier, and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.